Japan went to negative interest rates back in 2016 to try to stave off deflation. And it has been the world's last central bank to have a negative interest rate policy. But there's an expected rate hike to change that tonight. What does it matter? Will it, will it push up the currency, for example? Are there factors investors may be missing here? We are joined in studio by Bipan Ray. He's Global Head of FX Strategy at CIBC Capital Markets. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, I think we have a chart showing how out of step Japan has been, to yeah. put it mildly. And it's incredible. They have hung on to these negative interest rates all this time. Yep. I mean, the, if you look at Japan and compared to some of the other not just developed market but emerging markets, there's a long legacy of deflation there. That's been in place since the real estate bubble, really, of the late 80s, early 90s. So, I mean, the fact that they've been lockstep uh, out of uh, lockstep, let's say, with other central banks and held on to negative interest rates so long tells you how deep the problem was for the last for the last 30 years. Just a lack of demand or a lack of pricing power among companies? I would tie it to the lack of demand. I mean, if you look at Japan, you look at the demographics, completely different than uh, what we're seeing in other parts of the developed world, including here in Canada. You've got an aging demographic that, you know, the marginal propensity to save is much greater than it is to consume. So again, interest rates tend to be lower in Japan. And as a result, capital tends to flow out of the country into other uh, markets. Yeah, so Japan becomes a huge source of capital for the world because people borrow at negative rates, right. or let's, let's call it zero, yep. and then they can invest all around the world. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's been part of this sort of, you know, if you're a Japanese uh, consumer, or let's say you're saving in Japan, I mean, you don't really have that many options when it comes to Japanese assets, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, aside from the Nikkei. And if the Nikkei hasn't been performing well, well you got to look outside of the country. And right, so, you know, if we look at the pr proportion of Japanese ownership of foreign bond markets, it's, it's incredibly high, including here in Canada. It tends to be a, a little higher. Now, now, mind you, not to the name, same extent as we see from investors from the United States. But still, I mean, it, 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 there is a lot of, uh, in terms of power, in terms of when it comes to capital exports out of Japan and into other markets for that reason. I suppose one problem that could occur for people who've done this carry trade mm -hmm. would be if they borrowed low cost in Japan or negative cost, a massive run up in the yen yes. would obviously hurt them. Right. But is that likely to happen? At this stage, no, because in, again, a lot of it is going to tie to Bank of Japan policies. Uh, sure, we're expecting them to hike interest rates. I mean, it's not going to be the conventional hikes that we've seen here in Canada nor in the United States. They're going to hike by 10 basis points. <laughs> and that's going to apply to their bottom tier. Because again, if we look at the mechanics of a rate hike, a rate hike in Japan is not the rate hike as it is in the US and Canada. How they sort of delineate and how they sort of pass through a rate hike is they have three levels of reserves when it comes to their banking system. And only the bottom tier is penalized with negative interest rates. And if they're raising that from, say, you know, minus 10 beeps to zero, I mean, again, there's not really much of a follow through effect there uh, when it comes to uh, a rate hike in Japan in the conventional sense. So we have to look further out. You know, how concerned are they with inflation finally starting to take hold in Japan? Does this lead to a series of conventional hikes? These are the things that are ultimately going to drive the yen higher. But if it's just an exit from negative interest rates today, I would say the market's already priced for that. So we, we, we're unlikely to see a cascading set of problems for people who borrowed in Japan. If they get, in the near term, anyway, they wouldn't be hurt by a rise in the currency. And this, if this is all we get today, if it's just an exit from ne negative interest rates, I would mm -hmm. argue no. But you know, if they say something with respect to yield curve control, which is the other major policy that they're running further out the curve the, to target ten-year yields or at least cap them from rising too aggressively, if there's nothing done there. Then yes, you could make the argument that you're probably not going to see a sustained run higher for the Japanese yen. I mean, I don't think Japan has been in a recession. It's just had near zero growth. Am I right in thinking that? So initially, when we did get the Q4 GDP print, I believe it was Q4 or Q3, there were a couple of quarters of negative growth. Oh, but that's okay. since been revised higher. So they, you know, they've been flirting with near zero growth, with slightly negative growth. So you could call it a traditional recession, or at least a recession in the traditional sense. But it's not nearly as deep and, and as you know, meaningful as we've seen in other economies over the last couple of cycles. So has it has the Japanese populace suffered? I mean, they have low crime, they have free health care. Right. It's a pretty nice place to live in some ways. In some ways, yes. I mean, but at the same time, you have a labor market that's not really flexible. Uh, it, it needs a lot more work done there. You know, you, you're finally starting to see some degree of, uh, of fiscal spending as well that's passing through. And you're finally starting to see wages move higher mm -hmm. in Japan. And that's been the sort of catalyst for a lot of the Bank of Japan's thinking is that if you've looked over the past uh, several decades, you haven't really seen wages increase in a meaningful way. Well, last week we did get the largest union uh, 
or group of unions in Japan finally negotiate wages higher, close to 5% year over year. That is the highest wage increase in three decades. And so there's greater confidence now that Japan has exited deflation and is now entering into a new cycle where tightening in monetary policy is, is going to be needed. It does seem to be really moving at its own pace, but very down on immigration. And as mm -hmm. far as I know, women still behind in many ways in the workforce. No, yes, exactly. I mean, you're not seeing the same degree of participation when it comes to women in the labor force as you do in uh, some of the other major developed economies. And Germany, of course, Denmark, they went through their own negative interest rate policy, but they, they moved more decisively away from that. They did, yes. They, and uh, we've seen the ECB hike quite aggressively over the last little yes. while. And, of course, they also adjusted the way they approach monetary policy going forward last week. And in terms of technicalities, you know, they, it's unlikely we'll go back to negative rates uh, in the near term uh, in the European Union. But at the same time, they're switching uh, the way they conduct policy to more of a demand-driven floor system as well. Um, very technical, but at the, at the very least, it gives us greater confidence that they're probably going to keep rates in positive territory for some time now, and at the same time focus on trimming their balance sheet, uh, which has grown to ex excessively large size. And Sorry, just flipping back to Japan for a second. Mm -hmm. They have a very big debt load, I think, the governments there. They do. But a lot of it is domestically held. Domestically held, yes, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why we think that there's going to be a slower move uh, when it comes to tightening policy in Japan is, look, a lot of the debt that's held, uh, especially when it comes to JGBs, is held in Japan. Mm -hmm. So they can't necessarily rip off the band-aid by allowing uh, the yield curve control program to immediately go away. Otherwise, you'd run the risk of seeing the long end sell off because of the fact that, you know, there's a large degree of, uh, of, uh, of government debt in, in Japan. So, you know, it's going to be a very slow moving policy. It's going to be very slow push towards tightening. And unfortunately, I mean, or fortunately, the Japanese yen is going to continue to have uh, pressures on it, uh, potentially to depreciate further.